In this video, I will cover the ECHO Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, or the ESPR. So the ESPR is a new regulation in 2024 that establishes a framework to improve the environmental sustainability of products. The first question you may have is, which products are covered by the ESPR? Well, the definition is very broad. You find in the regulation itself that it stated that the regulation shall apply to any physical good that is placed on the EU market. That's in theory, all products, all consumer products at least. There are exemptions, but these refer to food, some medical products, plants, and so on. In order to narrow this down a bit, we can look at the well, what is stated about the first working plan. And what is written here, and this is also from the ESPR itself, is that they will prioritize to develop measures for certain product groups. And here we find textiles, garments and footwear, furniture, and also energy-related products. This could be, say, LED light bulbs, air conditioning units, other products already covered by the ECHO Design Directive. But that concerns energy efficiency. The way the SPR is structured is that, as mentioned, it is a framework regulation. So it has broad requirements, general requirements that, in theory, would apply to all products. But that's not the way it works. Instead, it relies on delegated acts under the ESPR to set category-specific requirements. And on the previous slide, that gives us an indication for the product categories for which the EU will develop delegated acts. Let's say they, will develop, they may develop a delegated act for external power supplies. Just to give an idea, it's just an example. The delegated act will also reference harmonized standards that will set the technical requirements that will inform me or an engineer, what must be done in order to, from a technical perspective, design a product for compliance. This is a very simplified view of the, how the ESPR is set to function. If we look at the framework regulation briefly, when I said that it covers broad general requirements, what I'm referring to is general requirements concerning delegated acts. It sets... Um, a certain framework that determines what is to be included in a delegated act to keep them somewhat standardized to ensure they don't diverge too much. It also sets labeling requirements or general labeling requirements, requirements concerning the digital product passport. We we'll get to that in a bit. Documentation requirements, declaration of conformity, technical documentation, instructions, and also provisions that concern the destruction of unsold consumer products. Delegated acts are, as I mentioned, category or even product specific. So if you are a manufacturer or an importer, you will primarily, not entirely, but primarily be looking at delegated acts in the future. Because in the delegated act, you will find lists of harmonized standards. You will find the actual provisions, the actual information that you must include in, say, a digital product passport and how to set it up what to include in the Declaration of Conformity, technical documentation, labeling requirements, the conformity assessment procedures to follow, and also testing requirements, which would perhaps also include requirements that concern notified bodies. As I mentioned, there's already, as you may know, an ECHO design directive in place. And it primarily focuses on energy efficiency. Now, the ESPR, it still covers energy efficiency, but it goes beyond that, which is why we're looking at a new regulation that's not, not only taking, say, lighting products and, and home appliances um, into consideration, but also textiles and so on. You can find a more, uh, let's say, specific and detailed list of objectives of the ESPR on Eurolex. But just for context, beyond energy efficiency, we may be looking at delegated acts setting requirements for emissions or durable design, a combination of these. So these are just examples of the way that the ESPR could potentially impact your products in practice. That being said, the first delegated act is to be adopted not before July 2025. And right now is July 2024, as I'm recording this. So there's no delegated act for me to dig into and, and 
well, use as a case study. There will be in the future. That's the current status of the ESPR. Right now, it's very much a framework uh, regulation. It does have a lot of interesting information, though, and actual framework regulation, because it does inform, well, it does inform the, uh, um, the people that will develop the delegated acts on the constraints they have and what they must achieve. So it still gives us pretty strong hints about what we can expect in the future. And one thing that is of high interest is the digital product passport. Well, es essentially, the digital product passport requires that you first register your product. It must have a unique product identifier. This will likely be in some sort of official database. Once you have obtained this, you can then affix a QR code to the packaging or maybe the product. We, I, I don't know the exact details yet, and I didn't read the entire ESPR. But what I do know is that you need a data carrier somewhere on the product packaging. It could be a watermark, or it could also be a QR code. The digital product passport will then be accessible by, say, scanning this QR code. And on this passport, which is in practice, well, at least in theory, perhaps a web page, perhaps some sort of phone application or combination, from where you can access information about the product, digital user instructions, and so on. Details will be provided in the delegated acts. Should also be noted that the infrastructure is not exactly in place yet. What is stated in the ESPR is that the Commission shall set up a digital registry by July 2026. So it's not it's not it's not there yet. It will be, but not now, not in 2024. Finally, we have the destruction of unsold consumer products. And when I say finally, that's finally in my video. There's a lot more to the ESPR, but this is a quick, brief introduction, high-level overview. But anyway, this is something that's, at least as far as I know, completely new. And it's also very interesting. So from July 2026, the destruction of unsold consumer products listed in Annex 7, and we'll get to that in a bit, shall be prohibited. This paragraph will, however, not apply to micro and small enterprises. A definition can be found in the ESPR. And this provision, well, the effective date is delayed to July 2030 for medium-sized enterprises. Again, I believe you can find a definition in the ESPR. This is interesting because this demonstrates that the EU is aware of uh, the fact that they cannot place well, at least not too much of a regulatory burden on um, small businesses. Clearly, the, let's say, capability and resources uh, at hand for an online store to, say, predict the right volumes to buy to avoid waste and so on, is, uh, is, yeah, it's, not, it's not comparable to, say, Sarah or H&M or these, these big retail chains. Just to be clear, Article 25... Um, it covers a lot more than this, but this this is just the introduction. If you want to go into detail, you go into Article 25 and you can read more about this. Finally, let's look at Annex 7, which actually lists the products that are now to be prohibited for, uh, well, uh, for which destruction is to be prohibited. And what we see here is we see apparel, we see footwear. Mm, actually, that's, that's all there is to it, this. Textile products, textile products, and 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 footwear. Okay, so that's everything I have to say about ESPR in this very very brief introduction. If you have questions, you can you can go to the comment section on our website, compliancegate.com, or if you're on YouTube, you can just scroll down and write a question in the comment section. We'll do our best to respond. Um, if you want to learn more about the ESPR, other requirements in the EU, the US, the UK, and other markets, then go to compliancegate.com.